All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about performativity and political rhetoric. Um, a few reminders. So don't forget, you need to turn in your topic idea for your group uh, this week. Um, uh, in fact, I believe it's tomorrow. Um, but if you're having trouble with that, please email me and I'm happy to help you work through ideas and give you feedback or whatever you need. Um, otherwise, we're just going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so today's conversation, and you can see the, the PowerPoint this time, right, Joe? Yes, I can see it. <laughs> All right, just making sure. Um, so I don't start talking over some nonsense. <laughs> Um, okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about Judith Butler's contribu contributions to rhetoric um, so that we can see how she sort of works her way in here. Um, we'll also talk about uh, a woman named Debbie Main, uh, who is the main focus of this article, and then we'll try to identify a few takeaways from this article. All right, so there's a few things that we need to establish before we even get started on talking about Judith Butler. So. Um, this article, just to be clear, this article isn't written by Judith Butler, but it uses her as a foundation for some of the um, work that they're doing. Um, so I want to start by identifying a couple of goals of the article. So the first goal, um, and in fact the primary goal of the article, is Isaac West is trying to get us to um, recognize the, the value of everyday performance. Um, especially in relationship to the way people study legal scholarship rhetorically. So um, something he's concerned about is that legal scholarship, if you just look at the records, you're, you don't necessarily get to see the way individuals perform agency sort of behind the scenes or behind closed doors. And so he is taking a different approach. He's not saying that you shouldn't study all the legal transcripts. He thinks that those are valuable, but he also thinks that um, rhetorical scholars um, could find value in everyday actions of individuals. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing that he's sort of getting at is that um, agency um, is something that, that individuals are exercising all the time. So it's not something that we can necessarily capture and box in. It's something that changes. And if we study everyday performance, we're able to see the way that it shifts depending on context or depending on the person that you're talking to um, or whatever it might be. Uh, so those are the goals. In other words, everyday things are really important and rhetoric has not spent enough time thinking about them. Any questions about that, Joe? No. Okay, cool. Um, so the next thing that we need to talk about is Isaac West's rhetorical foundation. So he's getting most of his work from, um, or all of it from Judith Butler. Are you familiar with Judith Butler at all, Joe? Yes, okay. um, but more on the, um, I guess, like cultural gender studies of uh -huh. you know, performative, performing in that sense, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's typically where she's known. Um, and so it's good that you've heard about her in those contexts. Uh, so when we're talking about Judith Butler, we're and, and things like queer studies or performance studies, we're talking about things like breaking down the boxes that we are expected to fit into. So they question things like how identity is formed and how we as individuals play a role in forming that identity. Um, Something that's really important, a really important keyword for her is performativity, which gets at the fact that all of us, with, with everything that we're doing, we're helping to create an understanding of what it means to be a woman, or what it means to be um, an American, or what it means to be a politician. Um, all of our everyday things that we're doing either reinforce or work against that. And that's sort of what she's getting at in like a really small nutshell with performativity, sort of giving us the power to make change, but also the power to reinforce problems. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So um, more importantly for this article, sorry, we're not gonna obviously do this, um, is she's utilizing Althusar's interpretation of interpolation, which is something we talked about way at the beginning of class. Um, do you happen to remember anything about interpolation from Althusar? No, uh, not off the top of my head, but I, I know it resonates with obviously something that we went over. It's um, been 
a long time. And since we don't do tests in this class, sometimes it's hard to, to make those connections. But this is a good time to say that when you're working on your paper or even for your group projects and you're trying to find um, readings that fit together well, this would be a good reading to pair with the star reading um, because she adds a bit more to what he's okay. saying. She sort of makes it more complex. So just to give you a little idea, uh, sort of a review, um, Althusar talks about interpolation in a way that we have people who are in power who call out or interpolate other people into ideology, right? So Althusar was the ideology reading. Okay. Um, so what Judith Butler is doing differently is she agrees that we are being called out to by people in power. But she disagrees with the way that Althusar talks about recognition. So for Butler, the people who are called out to, like all of us who don't have the power, we know when we are recognized properly or when we are misrecognized. So, um, for example, something that's complicated for me before we get to gender, something that's complicated for me is I'm a student and a professor. And sometimes, and I think because like, I'm not young, but sometimes I have mannerisms that people think make me look young. Um, I am misrecognized as a student on campus at CSUN, right? And it's, you know, not that annoying, but it is a little bit because, you know, I've put in a lot of work to, to also be a professor. Um, and so what Butler would say is that misrecognition, when I feel like I am not being verified, could result in me pushing back okay. because the identity that I understand of for myself is not being recognized. And so I'm going to use my agency to say, hey, don't be a jerk. Or I mean, I, I'm not going to say that, but that would be one way that I could utilize my agency. Right. Another way that I could do that is by um, sort of being passive aggressive by saying something like, oh, you know, I have a, I have a class to teach. So, you know, thank you for asking me this question. And, you know, like sort of telling them that I am not a student um, yeah. in that way. Um, another way is just by the way that I dress. Right. So maybe the next day I might decide, OK, I was a little bit too casual the day before. So I'm going to dress up a little bit more. So that way, maybe I'll look more like a professor. Um, and not like a student. Are all of those, so all of those are ways that I'm using my agency to be recognized in the way that I want to be recognized. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so Althusar would, doesn't talk about that. Althusar just sort of says, when you're recognized, you're good to go, you're folded in, and you just move forward. So okay. it's important that you see the two differences, um, but see that they are sort of working together too. Okay. Okay, so before we move forward and we talk about um, gender more specifically, because that's what this article is about, any questions? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm trying to like hang in there the best I can. I know everyone's got it, so. Uh, I'm trying okay. to dodge it. What? I said I'm trying to dodge it. Yeah, well see, this, this is why online courses are great, because you don't have to worry about your teacher getting you sick. Um, True. Okay, so uh, this article uh, is getting at something that was taking place in, in the 50s and the 60s throughout the United States, but um, this article in particular takes place in Pershing Square, uh, and I implore, I encourage everyone to do a little bit of research about um, the LGBTQ history of Pershing Square, um, just to give you a general idea. Um, Pershing Square used to be a place where um, people who were gay, people who were lesbian would go and sort of cruise, which means they would look for people that they would be able to um, either have, e e explore romantic options, um, mm. where they wouldn't be able to explore those romantic options um, in their day-to-day -day life, right? So Pershing Square was like one of those safe spaces for people who were um, mostly lesbian and gay because the the rest of LGBTQ wasn't really like, they were there, they just weren't called that, right? Um, 
so do some research on Pershing Square if you're interested in that. I just think it's, it's great to know a little bit of history of Los Angeles and to see how important of a role the city played in LGBTQ rights. So that's all I'll give you for this, for this discussion. Um, but more importantly, uh, so the article is about Debbie Maine, who what she does is she goes to Pershing Square and because it's illegal to um, masquerade as the gender that you are not, what she does is um, she first goes, I think it's first she goes into the women's restroom and then tells a police officer that, uh, you know, I went into the women's restroom, but biologically I'm a man. Like she says something to, to show them that she was doing something she wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, so she gets arrested. And then a month or so later, she does the opposite. Uh, and so she gets arrested again. And so the court has to deal with these two arrests for sort of the same thing, but the flip, like the flip of the same thing, which I think, um, which, which was very purposeful, right? She, she wanted to sort of make the court have to um, question this really weird law. Mm -hmm. um, so this is sort of the legal part of it. What your author is trying to do is like, yes, all of that's really important and should be explored, but now let's look behind the scenes and let's see what everyday things that Debbie Maine was doing that allowed for her to utilize her agency in different ways, right? So not just in getting arrested these two times, what else was she doing um, to, to make other people sort of rethink um, her gender? Um, or to give herself some power. So uh, I know that this, so typically what I do is I ask people, what are some, some different ways that this was happening? Um, but Joe, I know you've been putting in a lot of work, so I'll just give you some of those ways so that you can all sort of go through the reading and identify some other ones. But um, some specific things that she's doing is, uh, first of all, she lies. Um, to, to some of the doctors, or one doctor in particular that she's working with. Um, the, so this article goes into like the letters between her and a doctor who was going to help her with gender confirmation surgery. Uh, and this doctor is trying to tell her that she should be careful about like pressing the limits of the law, she should not utilize the press, um, and just giving her a long list of things that like he's not trying to say she shouldn't be who she is, but he's trying to give her some advice on like how to be safe. Proceed with caution. Exactly. And so what she does is she appeases whatever like things that he's worried about in order to use him to get whatever it is that she wants. But then she goes off and she utilizes the press in whatever way she wants to, because she recognizes the performative nature of the press. She knows that if she puts herself in the press or in the tabloids, um, sure, they're going to spin things in the wrong way, but at least it gets people talking. So yeah. she doesn't care if it spins things in the wrong way. Is that making sense? Yeah. Even if like, whether you would do it or not, doesn't matter. Um, just seeing that her lies are an expression of her agency. Um, another thing that I've already talked about is her use of the tabloids um, not only allowed for her to feel more like herself, but it also allowed for the tabloids to start reporting on things like gender confirmation surgery. In fact, Debbie Main talked to the tabloids about um, getting this surgery in Mexico City, which was a place that she was able to do this with, um, rather than the United States, which wasn't allowing her to do it. Um, and so by talking about that, she then was able to communicate to other people who were trans that this is an option that you can take, right? So of course, the way that they reported it might have made her look bad in some ways, but she didn't care because she was able to make some changes and make some other people perhaps get um, the confirmation surgery that she wanted um, them to get. Um, is that making sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so these are sort of, I'll, I'll just give you those two. I mean, the other, the other obvious one is the arrest, right? But um, these are sort of what your article is trying to get at um, with these everyday things. 
Um, these really, what seems like small decisions to some of us can really be major ways of utilizing our agency that your author feels like doesn't get explored enough in rhetoric. Are you following me? Yeah, like this should, yeah. What underlying question? message. Yes, exactly. So we're getting to sort of some of the, the main things that your author wants to wants us to think about. So first of all, your author, and this is sort of reinforcing the goals of the essay, your author wants us to recognize agency as this negotiation process. So again, it's not something that we can box in. It's something that we are constantly doing um, in order to figure out how we can be the most me that we can be, right? The, the most of who we are supposed to be. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, everyday practices are important. Um, and then finally, your author wants us to think about how to find, if we are going to look at legal scholarship, we need to find the actual people that are being sort of um, talked about, rather than like look at just transcripts. Um, because your author thinks that that might be where we're, we're going to find some more powerful voices. Okay. So with that said, I want to ask you, so this is really difficult. How, if, if you were to study everyday practices for like a paper in this class or another class, how would you go about that? There's no right or wrong. So I'm just, what do you think that might look like? How would we study everyday practices? Exactly. Yeah through a rhetorical lens? Um, as in looking at our set, like the, the, our own practices that we that we put on, or I mean, are we just talking society or? So it could be either one. So this is sort of the complicated thing is like, to study everyday practices, at least in some ways means we need to study ourselves. Yeah. Because we only, we can only identify our own everyday practices. Yeah, and the, or, I mean, um, and I guess that's the the things we do and the reasons why we do them. I mean, whether it's on a smaller context or a bigger, like societal, you know, it, stigma or something like that. I don't know what the, yeah. the word. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to say, but no, no, no. So I mean, this is a hard question because this is one of those that, like, okay, you did this and you're to to try to do more of this, but what does this really look like for? the rest of us so one way it looks yeah. oh yeah go for it. oh i see i obviously you know just going back to like the judith but like you uh understand it from the gender reasoning like why do you you know cut your hair the way you do or why do you comb your hair the way you do like uh -huh. like those types of practices um you know because those are more i guess prevalent in society now you know gender and stuff like that and it's kind of um I understand that part, but I mean, maybe on a greater context, some of the other stuff that I, you know, I kind of might just not be thinking of just because I, it's just so normal, you know? So it's kind of yeah. like, you don't really think of it as something as a practice that you, that you really do that, you know, has an yeah. effect on society or yourself. Yeah. And this is why I use that professor student example. Cause I, it's really, I think a problem with using Judith Butler is that it gets used so much with gender because that's sort of where she started that we don't then identify all of these other ways that we could be performing or we could be having performativity. Yeah. And so even he does, he does the same thing, right? He's still looking at gender. Um, but this, this could work in any sort of like identity formation. You know, this could work in the workplace when you're talking about like making a transition, um, almost any place. Which okay. is well, what? I do. I, I think that you know, I get um, you kind of touched on the the student, you know, um, professor aspect. And I think even with like just you look at like clothing practices, you know, you're wearing something like I was. I grew up in the '90s. You know, I'm a lot older. Yeah. So then, like now, you see all these trends coming back, and you're like, oh, well, this is just how I normally dress. But now that now it associates you with being part of the younger crowd. You know, yeah. which now you're like. Well, I'm really like in my 30s, you know, I'm not really 23, you know, and then all these things that you grew up. So it kind of, it gives you, get, it, your normal practices now has a totally different meaning than it did, uh -huh. you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. or something that it was kind of about like you or just like where you grew up in. And now it kind of has been taken away from you and it's kind of reestablished into, um, you know, being put back into society as like something that's more youthful. I don't know. Yeah. And almost like ironic, right? So some, sometimes yeah. like the young people are wearing it in an ironic way 
and you might be wearing it and like, no, this is like what I like. Or what? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't know how often that's happened, but that's kind of like, I mean, you see it, um, you know, whether it's through like parties or, you know, people always have like things to go back. Like you, I've never really seen it other than like somebody just like kind of like a Halloween type practice of like, yeah. whether it be like, you know, let's have an eighties party or nineties party, but actually being re reintroduced into society as like becoming a norm, you know, not like just some flashback or something. It's kind of, it, you know, kind of interesting. Yeah. And your use of agency could be to continue to dress like you dress and sort of shift the way people see people in their thirties or to change the way you dress so that people will see you in your thirties. So there's okay. a lot of different ways that this could look. It doesn't have to be like you then change. Okay. But if you, if you stay the same, you might express like, oh, I'm, I'm like in my thirties and I'm dressing, you know, like you're going to try to get people to understand that this is why you're doing this, not to be ironic. But you, and your all, your agency doesn't, I mean, if I'm getting, it doesn't necessarily have to be something, a physical change. Oh, it no, could no. be like a verbal, right? I could be like, I could become more defensive about it. Be like, no, this yeah. is like, this is my, like, I was doing this long before, you know, just be like, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. that. Okay. So that could be, okay. So it's just, it could be, it could be diverse in nature, you know, the way it is. It could just either go left or right kind of. Yeah. yeah it fighting. could be pushed back or it could be like fold in and that could be on the outside or it could be with what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. This is one of my favorite readings, by the way, because I, this is what I study a lot in, in my PhD. So I really like this idea of everyday stuff, but I think it's really hard to pin down. So this is why I asked this question because we're still struggling with it in like scholarship. So it's so, it's funny because we said, and going back to the, the gender aspect of it, aspect of it. Now, if you realize like how, like, gender is such a crazy topic but then we also have these people now that like all all the you know people that are giving birth to kids are having gender reveal parties you know so it's like you're reaffirming that stereotype or that you know that binary gender system vice exactly. like trying to like not let it be anything so i always joke around and say like i'm not i'm not gonna have a you know a, a, a gender reveal party or something like that i'm just reinforcing the stereotype or something yeah but, you know it's it's kind of crazy how that you don't think I thought I don't think about something like that but then you know when you look at it from being educated on like how we assign gender you start to think yeah. about like how, how some of the reinforcement strategies you know by yeah. Yeah. How not to reinforce it and how we accidentally play a role in this right like yeah. what, like in like a celebration like we think no big deal but then when you really look at it it's like actually this was this I mean one is not a big deal but when you see everyone doing it it becomes very performative and it just continues to shape. Like if instead people decided to wait for the gender reveal until they were like four or five, and there were a lot of people who did that, then that could lead to a shift in the way we see gender. It'd be a little weird thinking about it. I'm thinking about that. I'm like, geez, if a four or five year old going like a gender <laughs> reveal party, I'm like that. I'm thinking that could be so catastrophic, you know, like, I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, but, but this is sort of the point of yeah. performativity is like to make the shift. Um, but okay. it takes a long time and it takes a lot of people. Okay. Cool. All right. We went off on a little tangent, but you know, at this point, probably nobody's listening. So. <laughs> okay. Awesome. No, I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you so much for this awesome conversation. And um, as always, check in with me if you have any questions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you.